We are now going live on YouTube, so I think this is the perfect moment to introduce our very special guest for the day, Mark Minebo. Mark has been the director of Plastic Oceans Chile since 2017 and regional director of Latin America since 2020. He oversees development, network creation, and the establishment of international contacts and education programs tailored to the Latin American market. Mark pushes for Chile's transition to a circular economy in different workshops and is also a member of the Board of the Chilean Plastic Pacts. He works with companies, NGOs, government institutes, and international embassies to generate a multi-sectoral collaborative network to manage this transition. Mark uses local and international examples to show how change is possible through will, collaboration, and vision. Mark has been representing Plastic Oceans International at conferences in Colombia, Uruguay, South Korea, Germany, and Portugal. Mark has several years of, corporate, of experience in corporate marketing before deciding to change his career course in 2015 and dedicating himself to the environmental initiatives full-time. He's a commercial engineer who graduated from the NHTV University of Brenda Holland. Breda, sorry, Colin, and has a bachelor mm -hmm. degree in education from Pontius University, Eidenhoven, and a diploma in corporate innovation from the Pontifica Universidad Católica, Chile. Originally a Dutchman, Mark settled in Chile 13 years ago. So thank you so much uh, <laughs> for being here with us today, Mark. I will now give you um, the floor so you can start your very exciting work. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much, the entire POP family, the POP movement family, and everybody else who connects today to this, uh, this uh, masterclass that I'm going to be giving. I'm very happy to be back. This is not the first time I uh, participate in the, the, the POP festival. I'm very happy that I, I'm able to, to talk today again to you and hopefully inspire you to, to learn more about plastics and the circular economy and also make the changes locally in the place where you live. Um, so today we're going to talk about plastics and the circular economy. Um, I am going to share my screen. Let's see if that works. Here you go. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Thank Great. you. As Anna already explained, uh, and I'm happy we're not a really, really, really big group, so it makes it easier to, to respond to some questions that you might have. Uh, if you have a question, please write it in the, in the chat. And Anna will let me know if there's a question and I'm happy to answer it during the course of this presentation. So today I'm going to talk about uh, plastics and the role in the circular economy. Um, as you might have heard about, the circular economy is a, a hot topic around the world right now. Everybody talks about it, but not that many people understand what it really is about. And then when everybody starts talking about being plastic in the circular economy and everything is possible, I think it's time to learn a bit more about what plastics are uh, what plastics not are, how the circular economy works, and also how plastic could be part in some way or another uh, in the, the circular economy. Um, as Anna already uh, explained in the introduction uh, about me, uh, I'm the regional director for Latin America for Plastic Ocean International. I'm also a member of CEP, which is the Circular Economy Platform for the Americas. I'm also a member of Enlace Circular, that's Latin American Network for the Circular Economy. I'm two-time president for the, 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 the Environmental Committee of Providencia in Chile, and I'm also, well, today, especially today, an international speaker and consultant. Um, be, before we start, I would like to mention two things. Today, uh, maybe you have heard already about it, today is the, the, the World Environment Day. So um, it's a very special day for, for everybody interested in the environment, and especially environmental organizations like Plastic Oceans. But also we are in a, in, a, in a few very interesting and, and bit months that, that give me something to worry about. And maybe you've heard of it. Um, the Earth Overshoot Day. Today, yesterday it was announced um, that the Earth Overshoot Day 2021 will be on July 29th. And what does it mean? The Earth Overshoot Day, I'm going to read it, what you can see on the screen, marks the date when humanity's demand for ecological resources and services in a given year exceeds what the earth can regenerate that same year. Or to put it more simple, if you would go to a supermarket, you would already have bought all the products that you can buy for that year and everything beyond that date, you will be buying with credit. So this means that for the world, July 29th is the average date that we as a planet have used all our resources and then we go into credit, which of course is something to be worried about. But in each country, that overshoot day is different. 
For instance, in Chile, where I live, the Earth Overshoot Day is even earlier. It's even earlier as May 17th. So this would mean that Chile is consuming even more than the average uh, country in the world. Or if you would put it in how many planets do we need to satisfy our consumption as a planet, we need 1.7 Earths to make sure that we are satisfied with our uh, consu consumption behavior. So that's something to really think about. How much are we consuming? How many resources are we consuming? How many, car what is our carbon footprint, et cetera, et cetera. So something to think about on today, World Environment Day. So today we're gonna know more about plastic and its role in the circular economy. Um, but to start with that, let's, let's start with a very easy question and I'm gonna ask Anna to help me out with this. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna present on the screen a question, a very simple question, is plastic good or bad? And I ask you to please answer according to your beliefs. Is plastic good? Is it bad? Is it both? Or I have no idea, I hope to learn about it today. Perfect, the participants are now answering. So in a couple more seconds, um, I'll show the results. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Two more, almost there. <laughs> Let's give it a few seconds. Somebody's maybe still thinking about what to answer. Yeah, one last. Give it five more seconds. If not, we close the poll. Yeah, let's go, Anna. Okay. So the results, uh, one person thinks it's good, two people think it's bad, and most people say like, well, it could be both. Well, that's what we're gonna be talking about because the whole issue with plastic uh, in many times is depending on where you live, depending on how you use it, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna be looking at that today. Um, okay, here we go. So, so here I, I, I have a photo, I, a few different photos where you can see all the different kinds of uses that plastic have. For instance, on the first picture, you see the dashboard of a car, a very fancy car. Um, and you, as you can see, many of these items that you see in that photo in the car are made of plastic. Uh, on the second photo on the right, you can see these seats in a stadium. Um, also there uh, uh, lately, uh, all the seats that used to be maybe made of concrete or maybe made of wood, nowadays are all made of plastic. But also in the medical industry, a lot of plastic is being used to help people. Like for instance, on this photo, you see a prosthesis of, of an arm uh, and it can help people uh, gain uh, their health back or help them to uh, integrate better in society. Um, so plastic is very important there. And in the last photo, you can see a photo of kind of gel or kind of shampoo. Um, where also in the in the um, cosmetics industry, a lot of lot of plastic is being used, as you can probably find in your own bathroom. So plastic has a lot lot of uses, more than only the typical plastic that we try to solve in the supermarkets. Uh, this is also a different kind of plastic. So here we go. Correct characteristics of plastic. What is plastic exactly? What do we really know about plastics apart from how to use it and how plastic is present in our life? So of the entire press plastics production around the world, about 99% of all this plastic is petroleum based. Yeah, it's based on oil. It comes from oil. Also plastic, and that's a bit what you see on the image, plastic is made from polymers. And for people who do not know what a polymers are, polymers in the end are long chains of molecules that are all connected and form very strong bonds. So polymers are very long chains that form bonds that are very hard, hard to take apart and break down. Yeah, so that's why they also say plastics and especially textiles using plastics are synthetic polymers, synthetic materials. Yeah, they're created in laboratories. Also what I can say about plastics that many of all the um, all, all plastics are used and created with the use of additives and other toxic materials yeah to make plastic more flexible to make give plastic all these amazing colors to make it more resistant 
um, uh, against temperatures, uh, etc., etc. So additives are a very important part in the production of plastics. And of course, on top of all that, plastic is very versatile, as you can see in all the photos. It's very cheap. It's lightweight, which gives it, of course, all the uh, all the amount of the different uses that you saw in the photos, and that you can recognize also in your life. Plastic is very flexible, and it's also very durable. As you probably have heard, plastics is material that has been created to last for a very long time, so it's very durable. So what types of plastic do you have? There are many types of plastic, but in general, you will recognize these symbols, as you can see, the numbers one to seven, on the basis of uh, packaging, for instance. If you buy packaging something in the supermarket, you will find this triangle with the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, so it's easier, especially when, when it comes to recycling and, um, and the consumer, how to recognize the different types of plastics without knowing everything about them, is in general, they teach you to keep and separate plastics based on the numbers that are there. Um, but of course, um, these plastics and the numbers are not only there for you to recycle in an easier way, it also helps you to identify that it's a different kind of plastic and you cannot mix it. For instance, all plastic bottles for, uh, for sodas and maybe bottled water is plastic number one. It's PET plastic. Yeah, it has certain special characteristics that works best with these kind of liquids. But if, for instance, if you uh, look at the building of a house and most electricity cables and those orange tubes that goes, go into the walls, that kind of plastic is called PVC and generally has the number three on it. Number one and number three should never be mixed because they are very different kind of plastics. And with one plastic and mix it with the other one, you can, and you call it in technical terms, contaminate the recycling process and you lose all this kind of plastic for it next recycling steps. Um, for instance, if you talk about plastic number six, that's called poly, expanded poly, polystyrene, sorry. Um, and that's plastic that is more called, more, um, more known as, for instance, styrofoam. And it comes in, for instance, when you buy technology, or you buy a computer or you buy a TV, it comes with these plastic uh, white styrofoam uh, protection uh, products. Um, because in general, this kind of plastic has a lot of air in it and protects very well uh, certain uh, electronic equipment. But again, you cannot mix with six with number one or number three or number four. And then the last number, which is very interesting, number seven. Number seven is not one type of plastic. Number seven always says others. All the other plastics that are not number one to six always get the number seven. So seven, if it says number seven is recyclable, it's never recyclable because we do not know what kind of plastic it is. Yeah, so that's also very important to, to look when you buy a product and it says seven and it says recyclable, that is not true. It's impossible, it's recyclable because it could be any type of plastic. It's all the other plastics left behind. Um, so that's very important to know what kind of plastics are in your life and, and the kind of plastics you can separate. And some kind, sometimes in your neighborhood or in your city, they can only receive for recycling number one and number three. So it's also very important to inform yourself to make sure that the, the plastics that you're separating are really being received locally and are being recycled locally. Because as you understand, many products that we use nowadays don't come from your area or don't come from your country. They could be coming from another part of the world where that plastic might be recyclable, but in your neighborhood, in your city, probably not. So it's always very important to, to, to take a look at the packaging and see what kind of plastic it is and make sure that it's being received in your neighborhood. And last but not least, and that's something that was a big surprise to me a few years ago is when I learned that to putting these symbols on packaging is not an obligation. So you would expect that this system of numbers is invented and is an obligation for everybody to use. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So it's possible that you will find packaging with a triangle on it without a number. And that's, they're not breaking the law. It's because that is no law. There's no place in the world where this is being demanded by law. It doesn't exist, unfortunately. It's something that really needs to change 
if we want to have higher recycling rates. So recyclability depends on the type of plastic, but also depends on the local system that you have in your neighborhood or in your city. Like, sorry, here you go. Where is my screen? Here you go. Yeah. So to, to understand a bit more about plastic and where it's being used, I think it's important to, to know that, okay, most plastic is used in packaging. It's the typical plastic that we're trying to recycle in our house. On a, on a global scale, it's about 40% of all the production of plastics goes into single use plastics. Plastics that you use only for five or 10 or 20 minutes, and then you throw them away. But we cannot forget there's still 60% of plastic that goes to other industries. Sometimes it goes to industries where plastic is being used for a longer time and other plastic uh, industries use plastic also for a very short time. For instance, building and construction, about 18% of plastic globally go to building and construction. About 16% of all plastics, about 59 million tons, go to textiles. Something that a lot of people forget. The clothes we wear nowadays, about 60% of the clothes we wear are synthetic fibers, or in other words, plastics like polyester. There are other sectors, 13%, consumer and institutional products, 11.5%, transportation like cars, planes, ships, etc., 7%, electronics, 18 million tons, about 5 to 6%, and industrial machinery, about 3 million tons. So if we talk about solving the plastic problem that we have around the world, yes, we should focus on the plastic we use on a daily basis, but we also have to look to other, towards other industries that use a lot of plastic as well and see what kind of solutions we need to find for them. So that's very important to take into consideration. Okay, so here I go with bioplastics. You might have heard of this magical solution that we are going to try to make plastics out of renewable sources, in general plants, and other agricultural products. Um, but not, at this moment, 2021, about 1%, yes, 1, 1%, 1 of all plastic produced around the world is considered to be bioplastics or bio-based. So to say that all bioplastics can replace petroleum-based plastic, we still have a long way to go. We're working on it. There's a lot of innovation going on but we still have a long way to go to reach, in this case, the, the, the amount of plastics that we're producing globally, about 365 million tons, uh, to make sure that we can cover that with bioplastic, we still have a long way to go. So bioplastics could be a possible solution for a certain group of plastics, but on the long term, we also have to find how to reduce and other kind of uh, uh, solutions that we have to, to lower the amount of plastics we're generating. So what's going on with bioplastics? Okay, here I made a little, a little a graphic to explain a bit more about, if we talk about bioplastics, we have to make sure that we're understanding exactly what bioplastics are and what, they not, what they're not. So first of all, on the left bottom side, you have the conventional plastics and the numbers that I just mentioned that are uh, PET, PP, PHD, PS, and PEVD. Those are the typical plastics, petroleum-based plastics that can last for hundreds of years, that are not biodegradable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So then we have three groups of bioplastics. Bioplastics, as the word bio already says, are made from renewable sources. Yeah, like for instance, sugarcane and other uh, other other uh, natural sources. But you can make from natural products, polymers, as I said at the beginning, unbreakable chains that will not fragment. They will not biodegrade in a nat natural environment. So there are, as you see on the top, renewable sources on the left, bio PET, bio polyesterine and bio TT, but they're not biodegradable. That's possible because they're polymers that behave in exactly the same way as pol uh, polymers made from petroleum. So if we move to the right side of your screen, there are also bio-based plastics like P PLA and PHA that are both from a renewable source and they are biodegradable. That's the kind of bioplastics 
that we would like to see more in the world because they can biodegrade into natural molecules. They will not leave toxics and toxins behind in the environment and they biodegrade sometimes only in industrial plants, but sometimes they can only, they also biodegrade at home composting. So the, the perfect plastic that we look for is biodegradable at home and it's bio-based. So that's one of the most important things. Second, there's also biodegradable, there are also plastics made from renewable sources that do not biodegrade. So there we have all the different groups, the ones that behave like petroleum, the ones that behave uh, biodegradable, and also the ones that behave in a way that they are not biodegradable at all. So those are the different groups. There's one last thing that I would like to say about, no, two last things that I would like to say about bio-based plastics. Bio-based plastics also are indicated with number seven. So when I explain that seven is others and that you cannot mix them and they're not recyclable, well, there, it is possible that with your plastics and there is a number seven, it could be biodegradable. So there we have another problem with the standard system we have around the world. Everything's mixed up in number seven. So if we want to create a system where bioplastics can exist alongside petroleum-based plastics, we need another indication for them to make sure that bio-based plastics like BioPet do not get mixed with other PET, petroleum-based PET, and make the whole recycling value chain uh, uh, contaminated. So that's one thing is very important. And the second thing that I would like to mention um, is that right now, what people are looking for is to make bio-based plastics based on bio waste. As in, for instance, if you have corn, a corn plantation, you only use one part of the plant for food and the rest of the plant could be biodegradable or could be thrown away. We do not want these plants to be used only for bioplastics. We want one part for feeding humans and we want only the rest of the material, which is considered to be waste, being used for bio-based plastics. Because the worst case scenario for humanity and for the world right now is that farmers get a better price for their products if they grow them as bioplastics and they stop creating and growing crops for human consumption. So we don't want bioplastics to compete with our food. Yeah, we're trying to avoid that. Um, but that's a big challenge because it depends a lot on what is available of bio, biological waste in a country and if that's enough to create bio, uh, bioplastics from them. So those are the different things that we have to take into consideration if we want to consider bioplastics to be a viable alternative for petroleum-based plastics. Taking one little break, Anna, are there any questions? Yes, we actually have a question on the chat that um, Julie is asking us, Julie Anderson, do all biodegradable plastics biodegrade equally? Very good question. Thank you, Julie. Um, no, they don't bio biodegrade equally, uh, which also makes it very important that countries that are trying to work with bioplastics also need to have what a kind of certification in their country. Because, um, for instance, if a bioplastic is being buried in my backyard, for instance, it biodegrades with the organisms that are available in the soil in my backyard. But if a bio-based biodegradable plastic ends up in a landfill where the conditions are very different than in my backyard, this bioplastic can still be around for a very long time and even generate, uh, uh, um, um, how do you call them? Um, uh, Sorry, I did a presentation in the morning in Spanish, so my, my brain is still a bit mixed up sometimes. <laughs> um, so there's still, there could be gases generated that generate climate change, for instance, in a landfill. Or if a plastic, a plastic ends up in the ocean where the conditions are very different than in my backyard, again, some bioplastics could be biodegrade very easily and other ones probably could also st stay in that ocean for a very long time. So again, this is where uh, uh, eco-design is also very important. When a product is being designed, it would be very 
necessary for this process to be including the different types of biodegradability of the product and where it probably ends up. So certification of these products is very important. I have an example here with me. I, I hope you can see my, my camera right now. Let me see. Can you see this paper? Yes, we can see yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. This is what I got in a hotel a while ago. And it said, bioplastic, biodegradable and compostable. I think amazing. It has even a logo. It has some leaves on it. So me being a person who wants to change the world would could be thinking, I hey, great. This is a bioplastic. I'm happy. Unfortunately, it has no certification on it. I have no idea what happens with this bioplastic if I bury it in my backyard. I went to the website of this company. It has no information about the certification. I could not find if these bioplastics were made from food uh, uh, products or it was made from waste. I have no idea what this product is. I don't know if this product, it might be bio-based, but it could be exactly like a petroleum-based plastic that fragments and contaminates the ocean. I have no idea. So my invitation for all of you is to look into bioplastics that are available in where you live. If people ask you about, hey, what about bioplastics? Tell them to do a decent investigation about the certification because that is the only way that we can make sure that bioplastics really are an alternative for petroleum-based plastics. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, we have another question from Naida Ayala who's asking, what can we do with all plastics that cannot be recycled in schools? that cannot be recycled in schools, you mean that they cannot be separated, they're not being picked up at schools or? Yeah, I think that's, I see Nail uh, nodding, so I think that's what she means. <laughs> well, of course, um, uh, what happens in many schools, um, of course, depends a lot on the local waste management infrastructure. So that what happens, what I've seen in many schools around the country is that they start with really interesting Uh, recycling programs and then they have been separating everything from the entire school and then they don't have a waste management company who can come up and pick up the waste so many of these recycling points at the schools that were very well intended by the people end up to be a local landfill for all the waste that everybody's just throwing in there so that's one thing that you have to always make sure if you start something like that there has to be a waste management company that wants to come and pick it up So if there's no options of recycling, you have to immediately go to the other option, which even is a better option, is trying to reduce plastic. So if you cannot set up your own recycling system at a school, you have to go for reducing plastics at school and find alternative products or alternative ways of carrying and, and, and using packaging in your school. Yeah, so recycling, which has been promoted as the, the perfect solution for plastic, is not always a reality in many places in the world. So there we have to go to the other R's that I'm going to be discussing a bit later on to make sure that we understand that there are many other options to reduce plastics in our lives. And, and again, transforming all the plastics at your school in bioplastics, again, it's a big challenge and it's not something that you can do from one day to the other. Okay, I'm going to continue. So to take a bit into account when you use plastic products, we're going back to general plastic products based on petroleum, yeah? Not the bioplastic, we go back to normal plastics. So what do you have to take into account? Something that a lot of people do not know and which is very, very dangerous is what happens with the plastics when they are being heated. I have a picture here of a meal, many people Uh, buy takeout meals on the go, going back from work to uh, from the office back home. They buy a quick meal and they put it in a microwave and warm it up. Or they have plastic at home. They have a meal. They put it in a, in a plastic box, put it in a microwave or warm it up. And you have to think about what happens with plastic. Plastic being a synthetic material has been created using heat. So when you apply heat again to plastic, only a handful of plastics are resistant against this kind of heat. So you have to make sure when you heat up plastic, the plastic product that you're using is designed to withstand this kind of heat. If not, the additives that I mentioned before will leach into your food. 
and you will be contaminating your food with additives and other toxins. So you, in general, I would apply the rule of never warming up products in plastic. I think that would be the best rule ever because then you make sure you're not eating and ingesting toxins yourself. Um, on the other hand, sometimes you're being served a meal into a plastic container, like for instance, coffee. A coffee cup made of styrofoam uh, uh, behaves in the same way as other plastic that you put in a microwave. Toxins leach into this warm beverage, in this case, coffee or tea, and you will be drinking those toxins yourself. So try always to avoid meals and plastic and warming them up. Try to avoid it as much as you can. Also, you always have to consider, also take into account when you use plastic products, what happens with it in the environment, how to avoid that it enters in the environment. Are you sure that the plastics that you're separating in your home are being picked up and are being managed in the right way. The last few years, we have been hearing about many, many scandals of plastics that you thought you were separating at home and that was being recycled in your city were being sent to countries far away from yours, being sent to Asia. Uh, or a few weeks ago, there was a, um, a big scandal of plastic from the United Kingdom being sent to Turkey where they didn't have the right recycling infrastructure and all the plastic was being buried. So it's very important to make sure that you understand that your, your plastic is effectively being recycled and being reused and not end up somewhere on the side of the road or another country on the other side of the world. And the last thing that understand there are two types of plastics, single use plastics, plastics that are being designed and to be used once and then thrown away and reusable plastics. An example, a plastic soda bottle. There are versions that you can only use once and you have to recycle. And there's also returnable plastic bottles that can be used many times over. They are being redesigned to be used and refilled and cleaned many times, about nine to 12 times. So people who say like, hey, I have a plastic bottle and I use it uh, after drinking my, my soda and I use it for filling it up with water and taking it to the gym or taking it on a hike or taking it to the beach. If that's a single use plastic bottle, I advise you not to do that because it has not been designed to be used more than once. And again, you don't want plastic or toxins to leach into your drink. So it's very important to understand if something is designed to be reusable or designed to be single use. Here is an example that I just gave. Styrofoam, like the, the, on the picture, being used to contain hot liquids. Please read what it says on the screen. I'm gonna read it out loud because it's a bit too technical to, uh, to process if I say it like this. Polystyrene is a lightweight petroleum-based plastic made from styrene, a synthetic chemical classified as a possible human carcinogen by the Environmental Protection Agency and the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and benzene, a known human carcinogen, according to the EPA. It is indicated with number six. So the number six with the triangle that gives you the feeling that's recyclable and that is safe to be used is being classified as being highly toxic. And what do we do with it? We fill it with warm liquids. It's the worst thing you can do with it. So again, our relation that we have with plastic is based on a lack of information. We don't know that. If you know this before, would you still buy a coffee like this on the go? No, but it's not being told to you so we can use it. And nobody's, and nobody's changing the law for, for this kind of products to be forbidden, it to be used like this. Okay, here we go. Ready for question number two. What percentage of plastics is being recycled worldwide? What do you think? Is it three and a half percent? Is it 9%, 12 and a half percent or 20%? Okay, here we go. A bit of everything I'm seeing. For last people missing, please cast your votes. Q. 
give you a last few seconds if you're having doubts. And let's close the poll, Anna, and present the results. Okay, so one person thinks three and a half percent, two people nine percent, and three people twelve and a half percent. Unfortunately, the world recycling rate right now is about nine percent. Yeah, why is this important to know? Because recycling is still being promoted as the best solution we have for plastics. And yes, we could say that most plastics probably are recyclable if we have enough volume of them, if they are not contaminated, if there are systems in place, infrastructure in place to for all plastics that are being sent to every corner of the country in every corner of the world to be recuperated and sent back to a recycling station. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So a lot of plastic is just ending up in landfills and the environment and is not being recycled. So we need to look for alternatives because we know recycling is not going to solve this worldwide problem. Yeah, so that's one thing that we really need to understand. We need to keep recycling, of course. If you have the waste, you have the plastic in your hand, then you need to recycle it. But we need to stop already getting to the point of having plastic waste in the first place. Yeah, so... To talk a bit more about that, recycling, here we have it. What is recycling? Recycling is a solution for when the problem already has been generated. When I say problem, it's when the plastic waste is in your hands, you have nothing you can do about it anymore, you cannot reuse it. So that's the last option you have. After recycling, you only have the option of sending it to landfill or throwing it on the street which we both want to avoid as much as we can. Um, also, recycling has been around for more than 40 years. If you work in a company and they give you the task, the goal, the target of recycling as much as you can, if not, you lose your job, probably they give you three, four, five years to reach your target. We have been working more than 40 years in recycling and we have gotten to 9%. That is not a really good result, giving it a try for 40 years. Another problem with recycling and recycled materials where, that are being used to create new products is that recycled materials in general have a fixed price. They don't have a big influence about what's going on around the world, but they're competing, the recycled plastics are competing with virgin plastic, plastic made from petroleum. And the petroleum price, the price of oil, as you know, go up and down every day, it goes up and down and up and down. What happens, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, the oil prices went down a lot. So oil was very cheap, which means if oil is very cheap, virgin plastic, new plastic is also very cheap and recycled plastic cannot compete with that. There's also a lot of challenges in logistics, the logistical challenges with recycling. Once plastic is out there, it's very hard to get it back to the recycling plants. There's still a very low demand for re recycled plastic products and which is, this is a good news, many more and many countries are working on extended producer responsibility laws, which means if you're a company that puts plastic in the market, you as a company also are responsible for getting the plastic back into the recycling plant. So I invite you all to look if in your country, the, the government is working or is already uh, applying a EPR law. This is probably one of the big steps, next steps in trying to reduce the plastic waste we're generating and increasing the recycling rates we have in our country. Extended producer responsibility laws, yeah, EPR laws. Very interesting uh, 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 thing that's going on um, in many countries around the world. So one last thing about recycling or separating. A few years ago, um, this, 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 the graphic looks very complicated, but I'm going to try to simplify it as much as I can. On the left side, where you see the Red Cross, there are many countries that have been sending their plastics to other countries. Yeah, The country that had been recycling until 2018, most of the plastics in the world was China, with about 50% of all plastics in the world being sent to China for recycling. So that means that many countries, many consumers, 
who thought they were recycling in their own country, in the end, the only thing they were doing was separating plastics because the real recycling was happening on the other side of the world. So a big part of all the transportation and the containers that are moving around on our oceans are, 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 are transporting plastics for recycling. So what happened in 2018? In 2018, the Chinese government decided that they did not want to accept any more plastic from the rest of the world. It was called the national sort policy. So what happened with this big stream of almost 50% of plastic that was being sent to China, all these countries, I'm seeing here, United States, Japan, Germany, the UK, France, Italy, Canada, all these developed countries that were having such amazing sustainability plans had a huge problem because they were not recycling anything. They were just separating and sending it to other countries. So on this graphic on the right, you can see the same amount of plastic that been sent and move around towards the rest of, rest of the world, but China was not receiving it anymore. So instead of China receiving it, all these countries started sending plastic to Hong Kong, Malaysia, Vietnam, India, Taiwan, Indonesia, Thailand, the rest of Asia. So, so when we talk about plastic recycling and who is really doing the recycling in the world, most of it happens in Asia. But most waste is being generated in the developed countries. So there we have another big, big challenge in recycling and waste generation. If we really want to solve this problem, we need to find our local capacity to recycle and we need to find local solutions. We cannot keep sending our waste to the other side of the world. Because many of the countries listed here, they do not also do not have the adequate infrastructure to recycle those products. It's absolutely not sure that what has been sent from the United States or Japan to Malaysia is being recycled in 100%. Probably a big part of it is being buried, is being uh, thrown in the ocean or, or being burned, for instance. So again, there's a lot of myths going on with recycling. And we have to make sure that everything we think we're recycling is really being recycled effect effectively. Anna, are there any questions or can I... Go yes, to the next slide. Um, we do have a couple. Well, we have a comment from Julie who said bioplastic. When we were talking about bioplastic, she was saying bioplastic seemed like a better option than oil based plastic. Shouldn't we opt for bioplastics even with that, with their limitation? Well, it's, it's actually a question. And then we have a question from Priyanka that says there are many countries that do not have efficient recycling systems. So, what are some ways in which they can effectively deal with their plastic waste? Well, again, um, plastic waste and, and, and the, the challenges many times are logistical challenges. In a country like India, but also a country like Chile, where I live, um, the distances are so big that for many companies that are trying to have a business model with recycled plastics, they don't have, uh, they don't have a business because their logistic costs are so high that they cannot have a business model because their plastic, their recycled plastic is going to be too expensive to compete with virgin plastic. That's one of the biggest challenges. Um, and the other challenge again is uh, there is problems with infrastructure. There's, there's a problem with investment. So one of the things that I mentioned, these EPR laws, what happens in many countries, once a government decides to implement an EPR law, this also comes with investments. And with these investments, because it's the, end, it's the companies that have to pay for the waste they generate, it's the companies that have to invest in this recycling infrastructure. So there you come to a more uh, integral solution, both the companies having to pay for the waste management and also investments being generated to create the right infrastructure to process all these kinds of plastics. So again, I, I recommend to look if there are EPR laws in your country or that they're working on it because many of those countries are the countries that are also investing in infrastructure. And there are also investment companies, worldwide investment companies that are looking around, around the world where they can invest in infrastructure, but generally do not invest if there's not a local EPR law available. So if you're thinking about looking for international investment, also look for this EPR law in your country because you have a bigger chance of getting investments if you have that kind of legislation uh, uh, available. 
Anna, was there a third question? Yes, we actually have another question from Kevin that says, what option would you suggest for restaurants, coffee, sh coffee shops that want to give their clients the change? So they take the hot product when the client couldn't finish it. So like um, for takeaway containers. Yes, uh, that's one of the biggest challenges going on around the world and also in the country where I live in Chile. Well, we've in a way fixed a bit the problem because we just approved a legislation in Chile to, to have a ban on all these kinds of plastics. So we are in a way uh, having an obligation. These companies are going to be obliged. They're going to be forced to make changes. The question is, if we change all these throwaway single-use plastic cups for paper cups, is that a better solution? Because we're going to need to cut more trees and create more cardboard for these cups. So there we have one challenge. Um, I know in a few countries around the world, there's going, there are pilot products, product projects going on of having reusable cup systems where you can have takeaway cups. You only leave a deposit of a few cents. You can take the cup with you home and you can give, bring it back to a central collection point of these same cups. That's some, one system that I've seen. I have also seen uh, coffee shops that have a rule that if you bring your own cup from home, you get a discount. So again, there you are being incentivized to bring your own cup from home and you drink the cup on the street. And there also, there's also the option of very smart innovations. If you don't want to walk around with a big mug in your, in your bag, uh, there are some small innovations. I don't have an example here, but I've seen innovations of little um, stainless steel cups that are working like a telescope. So if you put a liquid in there, it grows on uh, like a telescope to the bottom. So something that is this size, very small, like this size, can grow as a telescope down, and then you have an entire cup. So you can also have find alternative products like that with a little bit more design and innovation. Those are the best options that, that, that we've seen. And we've seen also systems, but like for takeaway food, food containers that are also reusable. Uh, but you then have to have a logistic system for the consumer to be able to bring back those same uh, containers to the same restaurant or to the same system between a group of restaurants. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, any other questions, Anna? Not so far. Okay. So then far, I'll, those were all of them. Then I'll continue. So now we end up at the part of the circular economy. Now we know everything about plastic, about almost anything, uh, about bioplastics, what are plastics used for. Something, somebody's at the door, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else um, <laughs> um, But we need to know, okay, so what's, what's this deal about the circular economy that everybody talks about? Like circular economy is the magical solution for everything. So plastics in the circular economy, talking a bit more about recycling, etc. cetera. Um, so Samantha McBride, who's a waste management expert said the following in a news article a while ago, any material in the world can be recycled if you separate it you prepare it and you pay enough money to put it through the recycling process because there's a lot of money involved. So the question is, is there a market for it? Because the market is what drives recycling. Yeah, this is very important to know, to understand because circular economy, as the word says, there has to be economy in it. There has to be a return of investment. There has to be money involved. So. If there is no market for these materials, nobody's going to buy it. And if nobody's going to buy it, people will stop recycling. So that's the first thing we have to understand. The circular economy is a circular system that is being driven by uh, demand. And of course, what it, there is available in the market. There has to be a market for it. So what is the idea behind the circular economy? It's In a way, it's pretty simple. You have to make better use of resources because right now we're not do doing a very good job with the use of resources. We use them and we throw them away. We have to close the loops of resource flows, which means we don't want resources to escape the system, which happens now uh, all around the world. We need to fully recover materials instead of wasting them. And we need to prevent the generation of waste and contamination through better product and material design and keeping them in use for longer. So we don't want a product to be used in a short moment of time and then throw it away. We want to use product as long as we can, 
We don't want it to lose any value and we want to keep using it over and over again. Yeah, so value in a circular economy that products do not lose value is very important. And if we want to be perfectionists about the circular economy, and we try to do that, of course, if it's possible, also use renewable energy and be regenerative. Regenerative is also very important in the circular economy. So um, talking about innovation and, and using the example of packaging, um, what is normally innovation focused on? Innovation normally is focused on trying to improve packaging, make it as lightweight and as small as possible, and make it as easy as possible to be used. So if we look at the drinks that we have right now, about 50, 60, 70, maybe even more years ago, we, everything, we had everything in glass bottles. So the recovery rate, as you can see in this graph, was almost 90% because all these bottles were already being used in a system that you would buy it, bring it back, and the, the company who was making these, these drinks was picking them up and refilling them and sending it again on the market. So after glass came aluminium. And what happens with the recycling rate and the recovery rate? It went down. After the aluminium packaging, we went to the PET, plastic bottle packaging, and again, the recycling rate and the recovery rate went down. Then we went to these boxed drinks that you probably know from home, which they're not one material. They're a mix of different layers of material, sometimes only plastic and cardboard, but sometimes also even plastic, cardboard, and aluminum, and again, plastic. So these materials are every time more complicated to be recycled because there's no technology or there's little technology to peel all these layers off. And now we are, the last few years, we have seen the rise of these plastic pouches. Maybe you've seen them to drink, <clears throat> especially for children. A lot of parents buy them for the children to drink these juices at, at school. And their recovery rate is almost zero. <clears throat> so what we're talking about with the, the circular economy, we need to innovate. We have to maybe go a bit back to the past. But we have to make sure that the recovery rates of these products, if they are not returnable and they keep being single used, we have to make them as recyclable as possible. I'm not saying we have to go back to glass because glass of course have a, has a higher carbon footprint in its transportation, etc. But we need to find ways to go have these recovery rates higher than we are having right now, which is almost 9% only and some products even lower. <clears throat> so talking about the circular economy, the circular economy has two cycles. One is the biological cycle and one is the technical cycle. Yeah. All the um, synthetic materials, all the human made materials and not bio based materials are on the right side, the technical side. All the biological materials that have been designed and being used in a way that they can be biodegradable after its use and compostable are on the biological side. So now I'm gonna project a graph and I hope you're not gonna be scared, it looks very complicated, but I will try to explain it in simple wording as possible. So here we go. So again, the blue side is the technical side. The green side is the biological side. The good thing about the biological side is it's designed to be regenerative. As I said before, the, the, the circular economy in its best case scenario is, re, is regenerative. So then we have collect, collection of, of the, the, the bio-based products. It can go back to a biochemical feedstock. There's anaerobic digestion. You can even use it, use it for biogas. It goes back to the biosphere. You can farm it again. You can use it as compost for agriculture, but it, it, it regenerates in the same system and nothing is lost. That's the biological cycle. But as I told, told you before, plastic is petroleum based. It's synthetic. It's not natural anymore in a way that nature has no way of separating these long chains of molecules. So then we have to look towards our technical cycle, which is the blue cycle, and there are many solutions for what we can do with plastic to make sure it never ends up in the bottom as waste. So what can we do with plastic? Now we have plastic. 
So I put seven R's here today. There are many more R's, but today I'm only focusing on seven R's that we can use when it comes to plastic products and many other products. First of all, we have to focus on using less material. We don't want to keep using oil and petroleum to create new plastics. So what can we do to make sure we use less materials? We need to refuse certain plastic products. Some plastic products should not exist, so we not need to get rid of them. That's refusing. We also need to reduce the amount of plastic. Have you ever bought, I don't know, a technological product and it comes, of course, the product itself is made of plastic or has parts of plastic. Then it comes wrapped in a plastic bag in a box full of styrofoam white blocks. Then they wrap it up in another plastic bag to make sure that it doesn't get dirty. And th like that, we have many other, um, uh, many other situations where we can avoid unnecessary plastic. So when we talk about use less materials, we, we need to design better and, and use less materials and think about, is this plastic really necessary? Then there's a group in the circular economy that try, uh, actions that are focused on using materials for as long as possible. How can we do that? How can we do that? First of all, we need to design products to be reusable because of something that can, can be reused many times, every time you, you reuse it, you do not need a new product. Like for instance, I have here a glass bottle, as you can see, a glass bottle. Every time I use this glass bottle, I don't need to buy another glass bottle because I can reuse it many times. Another way of using materials for as long as possible is if you design products to be repairable. Again, the example, of course, here I have an example of, a, I can't show it. My phone, many phones, are very difficult to be repaired. But if they were designed to be repairable, probably I would be able to use my phone a lot longer. Even if the phone could be designed not only to be repaired when it's broke, but also how many times have you updated your phone and then you get a message, your phone cannot be updated anymore because it's too old. It doesn't have the right processor. It doesn't have the right screen. You cannot download applications anymore. So what happens if you could renew your phone? They could change your processor, they could change the camera for a better one. So that means repair and also redesign many products so you can change the materials, you can renew it, you can upgrade it. All these things have the result that you can use your phone for as long as possible. And the last group of the two R's is when you need to manage materials when there are no more options. You already have generated the problem. There are no ways to extend its life anymore. Now you have to deal with the waste. Well, there are two options. One option is recycling that we already talked about a lot. And there's another option that's called revaluing. Revaluing the plastic, which in other words means waste to energy burning waste, burning plastic. And there we have a big discussion because according to us, the circular economy should not include burning waste and turning it into energy. Why? Because the circular economy is all about making sure that materials stay as long as possible in our economy. But if you burn it, it's gone. That material cannot be reduced anymore. So when we talk about circularity, burning a material is not an option. I'm not saying that burning waste uh, is, is not an option at all, because in some situations, maybe it is an option, but being looking at circular economy, it's not circular to turn it into waste. That's very important to know, yeah? So these are the seven R's that I would say, if we wanna deal with plastic in a circular economy, these are the options that we have to deal with it. Yeah, plastic being part of the technical cycle, we can refuse it, we can reduce it, we can reuse it, we can repair it, we can redesign it, and in the end, we can recycle it if there's no other option. Yeah, so I hope you now understand a bit more about circular economy and recycling that has been offered as the best solution for plastic. But if you see this system, that are there are many other options for us to make sure that we use less plastic and the plastic that we do have stays in the economy as long as possible.
So now we get to the last question of today's uh, masterclass. Um, what of these R's that I just showed you, do you see is best applicable to your business in case you have a business or to your daily life concerning plastics? Anna, could you show the, I think we put five R's here. I'm not sure, I think we did. No, we put six because I expect you not to start burning plastic in your backyard. That's why we didn't put it there. Um, so what do you think is in your case, business-wise or personal life is the best option that you see as applicable in your life? Reducing, reusing, regenerating, repairing, recycling, or if you have a company, redesigning. Everybody's going for reducing. Let's see. Ah, very good. <laughs> Two last votes. One last vote. Let's see. Give it a few more seconds if somebody is having a doubt. No. Yeah, let's close it, Anna. So the result is seven people are going to reduce or think they can reduce um, plastics. One person says reusing. Of course, there was a bit of a trick. I put G regenerate in there in case everybody paid attention because of course we cannot regenerate plastic. Um, but anyway, um, so now we are in the part that I would like to go to, I uh, mean, click, to open the microphone, to have a bit of a more conversation with everyone. Um, we are a small group, so I think that should be no problem. Um, I, uh, we can stop sharing. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Um, so I would like to invite everyone who feels like they want to share something about the last activity with, that we did, or maybe a, a personal situation that you want to talk about. Um, I don't know if you can, if you, everybody knows how to use Zoom and raise your hand. So Anna could tell me um, who wants to have the mic, the floor. Okay. Yeah, so we actually have two people who raised their hand. I think Kevin raised his hand first, and then we'll go to Chimit. Great. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's really useful. Um, I have some questions. Um, the thing is, from my experience, we have a business. One is a restaurant, and we were trying to change some plastic use. Um, for example, the clients that ask for for the container to leave, and I like the the answer you gave, um, which is, which could be useful, but we don't have right now the logistics to make mm -hmm. it happen. Uh, so that for example, they pay more and then they come and you can give it away and receive the money back. That will be useful, but in the moment, we don't have that logistics. The second, we have a new project in which we make um, organic soaps, organic shampoos and everything, cosmetics, um, and we use plastic, but uh, we tell everyone to give our, their plastic, their bottles back so that we can reuse it. There's nothing outside the toothpaste that gets mm -hmm. into the mouth. Everything is cream, shampoos, and everything. Is it okay that we use it like tons of times, the same plastic? Um, maybe, maybe toothpaste this will be too much because they, get it, they, they take it into the mouth, but everything mm -hmm. else, not doing that. Is it okay? Uh, we try to reuse everything so that in order to make each plastic have a longer life uh, so that the environment the impact is yes. lower. Yes, of course, it's, it's hard for me to give you a, a straight answer because I don't know the product itself. Um, what happens is, uh, as, I, as I gave an example of many plastics, are, plastic products are being designed to be used only once. Um, and many of these companies, I don't know if they researched if what happens with the, I don't know, toothpaste tube or a bottle of shampoo or, or other kinds of plastic products, if you use it more than once, 
and if their toxins and additives are leaching into the product itself. That's something that, of course, a laboratory has to has to has to test and certify, which I understand that with your company, you cannot do that. Like many restaurants, you do not have an area of innovation or product innovation. So there you what what, what you can do and what we've seen also during the pandemic, for instance, uh, there has been a big uh, increase in delivery companies that using applications to um, to to make delivery and logistics easier. Well, the same thing can go for restaurants and hotels that can work together to as a group or a hotel association, for instance, or restaurant association, uh, uh, set up a group about packaging and, and say, that, okay, as a group, we want to tackle this challenge and not as individual restaurants. How can we work together, look for producers or invite companies that offer sustainable products or say that their products are sustainable, invite them and let them tell you, okay, what are their solutions? I think one of the, the big mistakes right now, what, what is happening with sustainability, and especially in case of Chile, where we just approved a ban on certain single-use plastics, is that everybody's looking for a solution on their own. I think now is the time as, a, as an association of companies to put our heads together, maybe even set up a working group and say, okay, how can we overcome this sustainability challenge? And who can we invite to, to tell us more about this? Because we cannot expect restaurants or hotels or other companies to become experts in plastics or become experts in sustainable packaging. Um, but you can, you can invite associations that are exper experts in, in, in this. And I'm sure they will be happy to, to let you know more about what their solutions are for, for your challenges. So I would definitely look for help um and look for other companies even your own competition i think they they we need to think in a different way about our our our, our businesses to solve these these challenges so so i would suggest to do that thank you very much great idea and we actually have through, uh, through pandemics uh, restaurants are getting together for the first uh -huh. time in history so maybe uh -huh. that 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 could be useful uh, now to change also plastic, uh, plas plastic use. And exactly, I think I think uh, you would be surprised uh, how many other restaurants or other companies is gonna, are going to say like, yeah, we would like to challenge, fix that challenge, you solve it. Uh, uh, also, um, and they might be willing to look for solutions together. I think you would be surprised, and also you would be surprised how many companies that are trying to launch sustainable packaging in, in your area or in your country, uh, who are willing to talk with you about it and show that they are, how they are working and, and, and having solutions for your challenges. But you, of course, uh, if you find more companies that wanna you know, work with you to, uh, to solve this problem, it will be a lot easier for you to invite companies with this kind of proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anna, who's next? Perfect. So our next uh, person is Shimese. You may go ahead and speak. Thank you very much, Mark, for that, that wonderful presentation. I've been following with uh, keen interest because it's a very serious issue here with us in Nigeria. I just put up a, 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 a question in the chat what can we do in a situation where there is no, not even that is um, inefficient, but is non-existent, <laughs> as in where there is no recycling system mm -hmm. and as well, no um, efficient waste management system. Because mm -hmm. that is exactly what is facing us here in Nigeria. It is terrible. Where I am currently is in university environment. And if you see what is happening with, with transfer to waste management within the university, you can begin to imagine what is happening outside. Almost um, for over one year now, we usually do campus cleanup almost every month. I was just struggling to uh, log into my laptop to share the one we did this morning. Mm -hmm. So you can see the amount of waste plastic we accumulated this morning within the university environment. Mm -hmm. And if you go back tomorrow, 
you will get more than we got today. So it's terrible, it's unimaginable. We are dealing with a, a, a community that, that should ordinarily be assumed to be civil when it comes to at least waste management, but still we cannot manage it, even within the university. Mm. You find people littering everywhere with plastic, students are littering, staff are littering, professors are littering. So you begin to ask yourself, is it, what, what, what is wrong? Mm. What is wrong? So we have been doing a kind of advocacy today we are on a, you know, trying to sensitize people on how to, to manage waste, the role of staff, the role of students. What can we do so that we live in a decent environment? But again, you see that even government is not helping issue. The whole of Enugu states, there is no government recycling system. It's only one in Enugu, which is very far away from where we are. And that one is just being managed by a civil society organization. I don't even know whether it's civil society. They just use it as a, a business or a kind of maybe combining it as civil society and business. Mm. So it is terrible down here. What can we do? Yeah. We, we are looking at, you know, trying to carry out sensitization, engage the stakeholders, do this, do that, just so that people can get sensitized about these things. Because when you talk about recycling, it cannot work here. Government is not ready. They don't have the capacity. They, can, they don't, is it that they don't have the capacity or they're not just ready to invest no. in anything like that? Then no. provide efficient waste management is still very, very difficult for us here to achieve. So it's really very, very troublesome that when you come to a civil place like even university, if you go to the market, it's worse. Yeah. Work on the road is worse. Everywhere is being littered with plastic. Yeah. So what can we do? Yeah. Somebody asked me a question yesterday. I did an interview about World Environment Day, which is today. And the, 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 the theme this year was about regeneration. So they asked me about what was my opinion about regeneration. And I said, well, before we start regenerating our environment, we need to regenerate our connection with nature. We have become a society so disconnected, disconnected with our environment, our natural, but in general, our environment, as you, as you well said, everybody's littering. Why are people littering? If they would be connected to their environment, they would say, if I litter here, it always also affects me as a, as a human being. So, so what you're describing is a disconnection of, of, of a complete disconnection, a human disconnection from their environment, um, which goes much further than only uh, uh, investing in waste management infrastructure or investing in, um, in, 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 in technology. It also investing in, in education, education in connection with the environment and, and, and how you want to be treated as a human being. Um, so, so it's very sad what you're, what you're saying. I, I think it's something that should not exist anymore, seeing all these problems that we have around the world. Um, so I, a question I have for you and, and from what I've seen also around uh, the rest of the world, the littering that takes place on the campus of your university, is it also littering of products made by multinational companies? It's easy to identify uh, the brands that are, that are being littered in your campus? Or is it more general containers of plastic and cups and things that do not have brands on them? Yeah, it, it, it's general. It's general. Yeah. You know, people don't have this proper, this attitude of even disposing waste. I'm just trying to share the little efforts we have been trying to make, constructing even waste bin. I'm trying, I think I've shared one in the chat box now. Mm. But even with those things, people will not still use them, even though they are mm. inadequate. But if they are able to manage with those ones and dispose it appropriate, appropriately, 
it will definitely reduce risk. Because sometimes after rain, it is terrible working within uh, the university environment. Yeah. Because you see, you know, all the gutters will be filled up with a lot of junks and they will be there for days and nobody talk. The university actually hires um, um, truck that come to take away the, the waste. But it's just that it's not enough. No. It's not enough. And if they are taking the waste, it's only those ones that are in those bin, in the um, trash bin that they take. Those ones that are littered all over, they are not going to touch it. So at mm. the end of the day, it we keep taking some days before, you know, it's just yeah. terrible. I wish I, I can share it is better seen than imagined. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, uh, Anna probably has your, your information. So I think there also is, is a good uh, chance to, to share experiences and see how we can help. Um, and maybe from one hand from Pop Movement, also from us as Plastic Oceans, we have a great program that's called Blue Communities, uh, where we help local organizations with the activities they do. We help them with, with knowledge, with ideas, with, with other kinds of support. Uh, we tell your stories, which also sometimes people forget, uh, but telling stories about things that are happening around the world are very important to raise awareness, not only at the campus of your university or in your city, but also in other places in the world. And there, that, that, through that way, we can also find ways to support your efforts. Or maybe even, I don't know how many people live in your city, but before we go to the next person, uh, could you tell me how many people live in, in your city? Do you know? In, in, in Enugu state, generally, there are more than 3 million people in the state. But when yes. you talk about the university, it's also because it's, one of, it's the first indigenous university in the country. So it attracts people from all over the country, even mm. from outside the country. So we have huge population of both students and staff. I think the population growth is also contributing to you know, um, uh, uh, that's that, um, uh, in, inability of the management to be able to manage waste. My yeah. organization is a very young one. We just got a legal registration last year. But even with that, this environmental thing has been at the forefront of what we are trying to address. You know, when looking for people to support us to construct waste bin, I just shared some that we, we share, uh, we, we constructed and distributed on International Women's Day just to, to demonstrate that we are concerned. Then today, again, is the picture we, the waste we generated today that I'm trying to share, but I, I downloading it, I don't know what is happening, but I'll still share it maybe before we finish. So one, myself is thinking that there is need for serious advocacy. There is need for serious sensitization because I was discussing with um, the Rotary Club of Nigeria today because all of us, we are together in the campaign and the cleanup. And I was telling him that there is no amount of cleanup we are going to do that will help us because as we are cleaning up, people are still littering. So yeah. it has to start first of all from changing how we think about waste disposal. Exactly, and I totally agree. We, 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 we may need to start from advocacy, sensitization. At the point I was even thinking of creating a th something like club in the hostess. Because yeah. when you go to the hostess, they are just terrible. They are just terrible. They mess up the hostel, take it outside, mess up the whole place, and it is unimaginable. So a whole lot of things to do. Even sometimes they go burning the waste because some of the dump sites in the, in the university are so terrible that sometimes students themselves will just put fire and start burning it. The whole place will be smoked. Yeah. And it's, it, 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 it goes to show that people have low level or a poor level of environmental um, issues because even the bone in itself, sometimes every year will be so smoky that you wouldn't just know what to do. Exactly. So, well, I mean, uh, what I can say for now, please don't give up hope. Uh, you're here in a group of people that are, know what it's like to fight for the environment. We know it's a very slow a long road, but please don't give up. You're at the right 
place, I think, for people to also help you and support the, the efforts you have. So again, um, thank you for, for your for your comments and for telling us this story. It's, it's good to never forget that we might have things fixed at home, but there's always places that we need still uh, to fix the, the problems and help out. So uh, thank you for your comments. And, and please, I uh, try to, to, to make sure that you are in touch with Anna uh, so we can have your details and, and maybe work in the future with you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. I do have her details already, so I will share them with you for sure. Great. And we also have um, Naya who has raised her hand. <laughs> Oh, Naid, if you would like to go ahead, your hand is up. <laughs> Hi, hello, Mark. First of all, let me tell you, thank you very much. I think we learned a lot today. It's amazing, all, all, all the things that you are telling us. And I want to tell you, I we live in Tamaulipas in Mexico. We are the corner, the other part from the United States. So we have to do a lot of things because we know that many times in the United States, they don't know what they have to in recycling. Uh, we are working with, uh, with the schools here and we have around 5,000 schools here in Tamaulipas that we are working a lot. And in these schools, I cannot tell you all my 5,000 schools work in recycling, but in my schools around, we are recycling 20 million bottles per month. Wow. It's a lot, I know, yes. but we can think it's a lot, but it's nothing. <laughs> because we think if you see, you see, you see it's a lot, but we have a lot to do. And yeah. what else can we do? Uh, well, I of course I feel very frustrating because all these years we are making nothing in the schools. We're talking about a lot with all the students because they tell me we are making this work for a lot of years. Now we are what what would you have to do? They are making yeah. down in the houses but it's not the same. Uh, no. What what are we, what, what we, what, what else we can do? Yeah, exactly. I, I thank you for your example. Um, as I, that's why I also wanted to produce or, or present the seven R's that we use because I'm afraid that recycling has been used for many years as an excuse to keep consuming the same amount of, of plastics and other products as an excuse like, well, everything can be recycled. So there's no problem. Yes, there is a problem, exactly what you say. If you recycle 19 million bottles, that sounds like a great number, but we don't know if 19 million from, I don't know, 100 million bottles. So what yeah. happens with the rest? So I think when we talk about the circular economy in plastic, we always have to think about different solutions that are not only focused on recycling, which is the end of the problem solution when the problem is already generated. We need to, we need to fix the problem before. So for instance, with Plastic Oceans, we started a project that called Rethink Refill or Repienza Rellena, uh, where we work with reusable bottles and the children can drink water and drink other beverages with a reusable bottle. And so they do not generate any plastic bottles anymore. But again, that's a project that needs some investment. So the children have their own bottle, uh, but then that way you can start refusing uh, and reusing, so the, the different two R's that do not need any recycling anymore. So there we, there we have an interesting option that maybe could also be an option for, for, for your schools that you work with. Um, but of course, it also depends if you have uh, uh, drinkable water. In those school establishments, educational establishments, of course, you need to have water that the children can drink. Um, of course, if you don't have that, of course, it's difficult to have reusable bottles. But that is a project that we run with Plastic Oceans that could be an option also for, for where you work and live. I would like to be more close to you, IPOP. I think we have a lot to do now when when they are come back in, uh, possible in August. I yes. think we have a lot to do and I would like to, I want to be close to you because we have 5,000 schools and 20 lot. million yes. 20 million bottles sounds a lot, but really is nothing. When yeah. I see the garbage island, it's incredible. We say, and where's all the else? Where is it? Yeah. 
Yep, exactly. No, I think it would be good that we, we have your, your information as well. Uh, there is an office of Plastic Ocean Mexico, so you don't have to call me in Chile. There is a, maybe a solution closer to your home. Uh, but yes, please, uh, let's uh, try to get your information and uh, we can talk about one of those solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Naid. And I will definitely get your details so I can um, share them with the branch here in Mexico and we can be in contact with you. I don't think anyone else has their hand up. So I wanted to ask you, Mark, if you would like to add anything to conclude the session before we close. Um, well, I first want to thank everybody to take your time on a Saturday to listen to my presentation and learn more about plastics. Um, I always try the, the, these kind of presentations not to be too alarming uh, because we need to be empowered and find solutions. And of course, I know, and we heard the stories, uh, it could, sometimes it's very frustrating to work on this because you feel that everybody is against you. Nobody wants to learn anything, but the, the movement is growing. Uh, the pop movement is probably growing. The Plastic Oceans movement is growing. We see countries making changes. Um, I, I see Latin American countries also uh, adopting certain legislations. I see companies doing uh, their, their share, but we need more. We need to put more pressure on. We need to keep fighting. Every bottle that you can keep out of the ocean or the environment is one bottle that cannot kill any animals or kill ourselves. Um, so, so please don't give up. Um, we also started Plastic Oceans with, with just a few people. Now we are an international organization with more than 200,000 people following us all around the world. So I know it's possible. Um, just don't give up. Uh, please be inspired. Try to, you know, be, be connected with other organizations so you can be inspired by them and find other solutions. Um, and again, uh, keep learning, keep learning. Don't, unfortunately, I have to say, don't trust all the beautiful stories that you see when it comes to, for instance, bioplastic. Make sure you click on it, try to find if it's certified and make sure that the solution is really a solution and not just another problem. So um, thank you, Anna. Thank you, the pop movement family for inviting me again to, to be able to talk today and, uh, and hope to see you soon uh, or talk to you soon by email and talk about your, your projects locally. Thank you so much, Mark. I can, I can say from on behalf of everyone that this session has been truly amazing and really, really interesting. We've, I'm 100% I'm sure we all learned something new today. So thank you so much for joining us and for also taking the time to teach us all of these amazing concepts. Also, thank you again to all the participants who are here with us. Um, Naid has just shared the information on the, on the festival on the chat, so you can definitely keep up and um, join the other sessions we will be having. Thank you all so, so much and have a great Saturday.